how were you picked so i don't think i was picked because of my membrane knowledge or lack thereof but it was the overall ex- experience that i brought to the table i think specifically with membranes um, that can be taught to any engineer so that was not going to be the hard part but the experience and the skill set that i brought to the table i think that's what they were looking for so the oil and gas prepare you well then yeah i would say so welcome to the chemical engineering guys podcast a show in which we share stories and tips from chemical and process engineers we talk about student and professional life as well as important aspects of products processes industries and companies but more importantly what are the paths that these unique individuals are taking in this ever-changing world let's get started What's up, guys? Welcome once again to this show, Chemical Engineering Guys. This time I have Amar, which is a membrane engineer, but he has been his actual background is a little bit stronger on oil and gas, so that will be interesting to explore. He's, uh, he studied chemical engineering in Canada, and well, he is now willing to shift towards finance. So let's see how this goes with him and what are his plans. So Amar, can you introduce yourself and let us know more about you? Yes. Uh, hi. Well, first of all, thanks for having me um, on this podcast. So just for people listening, my name is Amar Mamajuala, originally from India, although I grew up in the Middle East. Me and my family, we moved to Canada just before I started university. So I spent five years at a Canadian university studying chemical engineering, after which I went on to work in the oil and gas industry for about four years. And then I moved to the Bay Area. So right now I'm working with a membrane manufacturer in a technical sales engineering role. And as mentioned earlier, I am looking to uh, move into the the field of finance. So I have been studying for and writing the CFA exams and also will be applying to grad school later this year. That's very nice to hear, Amar. I, I love how chemical engineers start and go all ways, all pathways. So that's what we want to share with our audience. So chemical engineers don't need to be always on the chemical plants, oil and gas industry. They can always shift depending on their needs or let's say wishes. So that's great. Congratulations on making this new shift. It sounds interesting. No, thank you. But before we talk about that, let me go back in time and let's talk about yourself. Why did you decide to study chemical engineering and why would you, or why, why did you wanted to move to Canada? What was your, let's say this little spark that started with you within you and decided to make a shift towards chemical engineering? Uh, sure. So as I mentioned, I grew up in the Middle East. So as most people know, the oil and gas industry is, uh, if, if you think about it, you naturally picture Saudi Arabia and the low-cost oil that is produced over there. So although I didn't grow up in Saudi, but in one of the neighboring countries, uh, the scene is essentially the same. So while I was growing up, uh, we had a lot of family friends, who were working in the industry, and we all know the perks of the industry, or more so even back then, you make good money, the work is interesting, and you can have a good life. So I think that was the initial motivation of getting into chemical engineering. And uh, personally for me as well, I realized that I didn't like physics as much. I also was not a big fan of programming back then. So my options were limited. And as most people have the misconception that hey, if you like chemistry, then you should go to chemical engineering. We think there's a lot of chemistry in chemical engineering. So that was my line of thought at the time, and which is why I decided to pick chemical engineering. And coming to your second question as to why I decided to move to Canada. So it was not really much of my decision, but more so my parents. They had applied for their immigration quite a few years back. And at that time, we had come for our landing. We had the documentation which allowed us to stay on in Canada. But at that time, we decided to go back. And then if we wanted to, we always had the option of coming back to Canada. 
So we did come back after three years, which was in 2010. And yeah, I've been here since then. Okay. And the chemical engineering bachelor, was it in which university? Uh, yeah. So I studied at University of Waterloo. Okay. Nice. And did you enjoy it there? How was it? Was it strong in certain points or maybe weakening in others? So yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, my time in university. In hindsight, I probably should have done more apart from studying a lot and worrying about securing the next uh, internship. So one of the strongest suits of the University of Waterloo, it's pretty well known around the world uh, right now, is for their cooperative education or internship program. You get matched with really good companies. You get pretty solid work experience. And it allows you to network and eventually secure full-time positions even before you graduate. So I think that's one of the strongest suits uh, that the University of Waterloo can offer students. And it was pretty similar for me as well. During my five years of engineering at the school, I had two years of internship experience in a few different fields, which allowed me to try out a few different things and then settle on what I thought was best for me. Okay. Actually, before we were recording, you were telling me about these co-ops, which I think it's great because you have about six different, well, let's say that the last two are pretty similar, but uh, that's a lot of experience. And I love it because it's four month experience. It's it's not so short, like one month that you don't get to mm -hmm. know the process company and, and the colleagues, but it's also not so long that you get stuck exactly or that you feel like you're actually working there so right four months i think it's perfect can you let us know more on your very first co-op sure so as i was coming from the middle east and uh, i actually spent even a couple of years in india before moving to canada there is no concept of summer jobs and working as a teenager so my resume was like pretty much blank i only had volunteer experience. So getting my first internship was pretty challenging. What worked out well for me was I had a really solid GPA after my first uh, term, uh, which is why a professor reached out to me and offered to bring me on as a research assistant. So my first co-op position was in uh, working with a professor that was developing fuel cell technology. Okay, nice. So you how does it work do you start and check out where do you get your co-op or do the professors know that someone some students will be free for their co-ops in order to work in the lab with them or did you reach with him how was it right so the way it works is that there is a job board on which they post all kind of jobs you apply if you get matched then you go for the interview that's a typical process But typically, first-year students and even second years to an extent generally have trouble um, securing a position. So this was like later in the term when I still hadn't found something. And then the professor had emailed everyone in the, in the class saying that, hey, if you're still looking for a position, I may have something in my lab, so let's talk. And he said that he's going to give preference to people with a high GPA. So I think uh, that's how I was able to make my way in. So I think that's very important that you remark that maybe you don't have any previous experience in, let's say, in, on the country, mm -hmm. but the only thing that you can work is on your GPA. So can you let us know more on that? Did you have the high GPA because you knew that you should or must have that? Or is it because you have been always excel in your studies? Or did you plan to do something with that? So I didn't quite plan to do anything as such. Then, although I did know that I should try to keep a high GPA just so that if I decide to go to grad school or apply for grad school in the future, it will make it easier. I've, I think I've always done well academically. Um, and also what I felt was first year of engineering, at least in Canada, um, was not that much harder than what I had studied in grade 12 back in India. So when I came to Canada, I really did not have to put in that much effort. The only course that was new for me was the chemical engineering course where we are taught mass balances, energy balances, and that stuff. But everything else was basically 
what I had studied in high school. So I did not have to put in that much time and effort into studying. And more so, I was helping out my friends who were struggling a little bit more. Nice. So that's great to hear to, that you were a very diligent student, very excel in your field. So how was it the lab fuel cell or how did you actually play with the equipment or you were just making notes? How was that first co-op? Uh, so the first co-op was pretty interesting and it felt really good to get my first paycheck at the end of the month because I had never had a job before. So that was uh, pretty exciting. In terms of what I did day to day was for the first part of the day, like first half of the day, I would say is that I would run the test setup. So we had a few different operating conditions that we needed to cycle the membrane through and we were essentially measuring the performance. Uh, we would typically do this for a period of two weeks after which we would change uh, the membrane material and then run the cycle once again. So during the week, as I would run the test setup, I would collect, organize the data, run all the calculations, and then at the end of the week, send a report to the professor summarizing the performance for that week. Uh, so that was about half of my day. The other half was... Uh, helping out any graduate students who were also working in the same lab with any of their projects. So with a couple of grad students that I was working on, I, I got to improve some of my mechanical skills. So they were building these test setups and they needed to fabricate certain components. So they would give me a certain design. They would tell me to work where I could go get the parts or the material for it. And then I would go into a student workshop and actually you use the tools to fabricate whatever they were looking for. So that was a good experience for me to start working or, or uh, that was a good experience for me where I got to work with my hands and get a little bit more confident over there. Yeah, definitely. Working with hands is something I think is underrated. Working with equipment, especially lab equipment, which is, well, of course, working with your hands in a very huge refinery will be almost uh, impossible move a tank or so, mm -hmm. but in the lab, you can actually move piping systems. You can move, uh, the containers, you can move the small reactors. So it's way much easier to understand the process. And also for yourself that you're like connecting the dots on the theory that you already studied. So that's great. Mm -hmm. So Amar, then you had the second co-op. Can you let us know how you got it and what was it about? So the second co-op, I did get it through the job board that I was mentioning. Um, so now that I had one internship experience under my belt, I think it made it a little bit easier. So I did apply for uh, this position through the job board. Um, and the position was, again, working in a lab, but for a company. Uh, and this company does bench scale and pilot scale hydrometallurgy, hydro, uh, projects dealing with hydrometallurgy. So, um, yeah, that's how I got my second job. Nice. And how, what, what was it about? What were you doing there? Um, most of it was running experiments in the lab and then, so setting it up, um, doing the calculations in terms of all concentrations, molarity, normality, all of that good stuff. And then after running the experiment, collecting the results, analyzing them, and then uh, discussing them with uh, my supervisor. So that's that's what I was doing then. It's nice. Metallurgy is always very interesting because it has a little bit on chemical engineering, where I think it's uh, a art in itself. So the industry is very different if you compare to other traditional chemical engineering or process engineering industries. Right. And then... You passed to your third co-op, which was at Procter & Gamble, which is a very known company on, let's say, retail products. What mm -hmm. were you doing there? Yeah, so I would consider that to be my first breakthrough in terms of getting like a proper job with like a big company and something that I was very proud of at the time. Um, so, yeah, I did join Procter & Gamble at their plant in Belleville, Ontario, um, and uh, the main thing that they manufacture over there is the the female pro or female care product called Always, so sanitary pads. Um, and I was working with one of the teams that develops the inner lining for one of their products. 
Nice. So that sounds very like a uh, niche application. So that's great to have. And what did you like about PNG? Uh, the company culture, it was a uh, very open, very encouraging. Um, uh, and there's no divide between say like an engineer and a technician, essentially when there's a problem, or even if there's not a problem, you are working hand in hand on, on the manufacturing floor. Um, okay, that's, so that's I really that. Nice, nice. And how, let's say, when your internship finished or your co-op, did you thought about getting a job there? Um, so they did offer me another position to come back because I still had about two years left till I graduated. So I did have that option. Uh, but at the same time, I wanted to try out the oil and gas industry, which was my initial motivators of uh uh, picking chemical engineering. Um, so yeah, at the time I, I kept it in my pocket, okay. but I was still looking for the break in the oil and gas industry. Which then comes right now in your fourth co-op in Imperial Oil in, at the refinery. Yes. How did you get that job? So you were like very insistent in getting something on the oil and gas industry? Yeah, essentially I had just started my third year at the time. I think one of the things that Imperial Oil really looks for is someone who is academically very sound so i had that going for me i had some good experience and the name of procter and gamble as well on my resume so i think all of the things really helped me get that interview um and i think i did well in that interview so that's how i ended up with the position okay and what was it about what was your main role um so i was working with um so essentially there's a refinery there's a chemical plant uh over there. So this is located in Sarnia, Ontario. Uh, and my role was uh, that of a junior contact engineer. So a contact engineer is essentially an operations engineer. You have, say, one production unit under you. Uh, day to day, you're monitoring the performance, doing any process optimization, as well as, as, well as any um, long term projects that uh, you are trying to move ahead in your particular unit. So yeah, I was working on, since I was only there as an intern, I was working with a few different engineers, supporting them in their respective units. Okay. And then you shifted towards your final co-op, which actually accounted for two, but it was at Husky Energy and you were working as a reservoir engineer. So that's, I think, one of the most interesting co-ops I've seen, I've heard of. So what was it about? Uh, yeah, so now that I had some downstream experience under my belt, I also I wanted to like round it out and get some upstream experience as well. So that's when I got my position with Husky Energy. And as you mentioned, I combined my last two uh, co-op terms. So rather than having two separate four-month terms, I decided to do one eight-month uh, co-op term. So yeah, my role was that of a reservoir engineer. Um, as you've probably heard in Canada, we have the oil sands, which is the unconventional technology. So um, the team that I was working on um, was using SAGD to access these heavy oil deposits in uh, Western Canada. It's very, well, not unique to Canada, but I know Canada has a lot of those type of sand deposits, right? Mm -hmm. They do. Nice. So... Now it's time to pass to this little part of transitioning from student to the actual, let's say, chemical engineer uh, graduate. So you got the job at Husky because you were a co-op there or would you say there was something else? Uh, yeah, so I got it because I was a co-op there. So specifically with Husky, they have um, this new graduate program. And at least back when I got in, it was only open to... Uh, their current uh, co-op students or former co-op students, they, they would not employ anyone coming from another company. So before I finished my internship, I had interviewed. Um, and yeah, that's how I got the position. So at least I think back in my time, um, they had about 150 or so applicants. And in their program, they would only accept 15 um, new new grads each year. So yeah, there was about like a 10% acceptance rate. And um, that's how I got into the program. So is it 150 co-ops that are already working inside the company? Yeah. 
wow, that's very a lot of competition, man. So mm -hmm. are they mostly chemical engineers or is it any type of, let's say, related field? So I would say most of them are chemical and mechanical, but you also have um, some, say, electrical, environmental, um, geotechnical, but very few of those. Most of them would be chemical and mechanical. And why do you think you got the, the job? <laughs> why are you in that 10% man? I think because uh, I did pretty well um, at my last internship. And before I left, I even had a discussion with the vice president of my group who essentially told me that he's going to like put in a personal word for me. And if worst comes to worst, he's going to try to bring me in as like a contractor or something into the department because he wanted me to come back. So I think all of those things helped uh, getting me the role. Yeah, definitely having an insane recommendation. It's also great doing a good job. Of course, definitely works as well. Right. And now it's time to deep make a deep dive into your job. What do you actually did there for years at Husky? No, so I actually worked at Husky for three years. Um, okay. Yeah, so oh, four years with the co-op uh, or yeah. three years in total. Three, uh, well, three years after graduating. Um, I think the four years you're talking about is my overall oil and gas experience, but I actually okay, worked okay. with another company after Husky. So we will we'll get to that at a later point. Uh, but yeah, essentially at Husky, when I joined, it was a rotational program. So the idea is that um, they have the new grads in a certain ro uh, role for a certain amount of time. Uh, and given that Husky is a fully integrated energy company, they have operations on both the upstream, midstream, and downstream side. So you get to, they have quite a few different business units, different operations around the country, and you get to try a bunch of different roles. So I think that's the same thing that happened with me. So when I came back to Husky, my first year I spent in Calgary, Alberta, uh, of which the first six months were again in a reservoir engineering role. Um, again with oil sands, but this was a different project. So yeah, did that for six months. And then the next six months were in a drilling and completions role. Nice. So what did you like about the job? Uh, the reservoir engineering role was pretty much an extension of what I had done for my internship. Um, so that it, it was, it was easy for me to like make my way in. Uh, and at the time, the project that I was working on had just been commissioned about a few months ago and it wasn't doing very well. So there were lots of operational challenges. So at least for me, from a learning standpoint, I think I got a lot, uh, got a lot out of that. Okay. And did you have to move like to very far away, let's say areas or was it near the city? How, where are these industry located? So I was working at their head office, so which is in the main city of Calgary. Um, and the good thing with the, the new grad program was they also give you housing or they cover your housing for the three years. So they had given me an apartment in downtown Calgary itself. So essentially I would just walk in to work, which was about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so yeah, it was pretty convenient in that regard. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, having housing near it nicely located i think mm -hmm. that's very enviable because many times when you think about oil and gas you think about going offshore or maybe abroad very right uh, remote places and oh, yeah that that does happen and i have done that too <laughs> okay when when did that happen afterwards that, yeah that, hap that happened afterwards at husky okay so let's finish with husky how sure. So yeah, as I was mentioning, my, my second position was in drilling and completions, uh, but the timing of it wasn't very good. So if you remember, or my position started in late 2015, so around December of 2015. And if you remember, that was not a very good time for the oil and gas industry because the oil pr prices had crashed and were in a dumpster. So just when I started, within a couple of months, all the drilling had come to a standstill. So even though I was in a drilling and completions role, there wasn't really any drilling or completions going on. So you were stopped doing no nothing, just waiting. Yeah, we were essentially waiting. Um, although I still got to go out to the drilling rigs for a couple of weeks before all of that happened. Um, 
but yeah, I, I don't think I got the most out of that uh, opportunity. Oh, so that's sad. But then you change. Why did you change? Did you were rich or did you reach them? You were looking on, online? No. So again, I was still at Husky and I was in that traditional program. So after my six months, I knew I had to move on to my next role. So my next role was offshore. Um, so I moved to Newfoundland, which is on the east coast of Canada. Um, and now my role was that of a production engineer. So even though um, the operating assets were offshore, I was still based in the, the main office in St. John's. Uh, but yeah, all of our operating assets were offshore. Okay, and production engineer, what do you mean? The, in, at the refinery or the, the offshore plant? What exactly? So production engineer for the welds uh, that were offshore. So I had a well pair that I was managing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and this well pair was in a new prospective location. So this, this was called the pilot well pair. So all the data that we were getting from it was or was being used for the planning and development of the overall field. And how far away are these fields? I think it's about a couple of hundred kilometers at least from uh, the coast. Uh, well, is it is that still Canada Oceans or how does that work? Yeah, so it's in the Atlantic Ocean. And then what comes next? Oh, and yeah, so I spent a year over there. Um, I I really enjoyed that role. Uh, because although I was also managing a well pair from an operational standpoint, I also um, got to participate in the development uh, strategy for the overall field. And this was back in 2016, 2017, um, when the project was officially even sanctioned by Husky and its partners. Um, they have since then been building the wellhead platform. And uh, last I heard, uh, commissioning is going to be starting next year so. I'm excited to see how that happens. Uh, but yeah, that was my third role um, at Husky. And then I moved back to Alberta, so Western Canada, in a small town called Rainbow Lake, which I think most of the people listening to this podcast will not know about at all. No, uh, I, I don't, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a very small town. I think probably like three, 400 people living there. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, at that time I was probably the only, only brown person in the full town. So yeah, as you can tell, very, very small town, um, Husky has a gas plant, um, out there. They also have a lot of wells. Um, they've had this asset for quite a few years. I believe previously at some point it was even owned by Exxon Mobil. It has since uh, changed a few hands, and right now Husky is operating it. Um, and given that the fact that it's a small town, it's pretty much only Husky who's in the area, and some of the other smaller companies uh, essentially just provide services and support Husky's operation. So the population I'm reading right now is less than one thousand people. Yeah, yeah, and that's probably not accurate. I think it's it's much smaller than that. <laughs> So how do you, let's talk a little bit more on the life balance because it's, <laughs> the work is, is pretty interesting, but I see that you move a lot and let's say in Rainbow Lake, how, how long were you there? So I was there for a year. And how was that year? Because oh, was... beside that, it's a lot of snow, so not cool weather, a small town. How yeah. So essentially it's, it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, that's, that's how you can, uh, that's how you can define it. The closest town or sorry, the closest city would be Edmonton. And I think that was about an eight hour drive. So yeah, you're far, far away from any civilization. So I was pretty skeptical uh, to move over there, but in all the previous uh, engineers and trainings or the new grads that I'd spoken to who had um, worked over there, they only had like really good things to say about it. So uh, I was encouraged by that fact. Um, so given that it's a small town, you get involved in the community pretty quickly. Uh, one of the coolest things that I got to do over there was I volunteered as a firefighter. That's great. Yeah, and I actually did get a chance to go out and put out some real fires, uh, got to participate in some proper training. 
and yeah, it was a really cool experience on the whole. I wouldn't expect that. So firefighter is something like, I don't know, I wouldn't even imagine. And those fires were man-made or were natural? Uh, it's, it's generally both. So now do you want to say a little bit more on, on the actual job there? Or you... Yeah, sure. So I was working as a plant engineer. So given that I mentioned the, the plant that Husky has, it's pretty old. There are always things that are breaking down and things that were not done to code or which can be optimized. So as we typically have the management of change process, someone initiates um, that request. And then depending on the scope, it comes down to an engineer to assess, um, evaluate and execute the project. So I had a lot of these projects all around the plant that I was working on in my year over there. And now comes the interesting part. How did you shift it from oil and gas towards membranes so and I, change country? So actually, I have another work experience in there before that happens. So I'd like to okay. briefly mention that. Um, so just after I finished at Husky, there were some circumstances because of which I had to leave the company. So I came back home and then was looking for my next job. It took a few months, uh, but then I got a position with Suncor Energy, who's also known as Petro Canada. And then I moved to Fort McMurray, Alberta, which is the hub for oil sands. Suncor operates an upgrader over there. So essentially you're upgrading the, the sand that is mined into something that the refineries can work with. Uh, my role was For the first few months, I was working as a process engineer, and then I moved into a contact engineer or an operations engineer for a hydro treating plant. I'm watching right now, McMurray, it's pretty ne not pretty near, but it's kind of near Rainbow Lake as well, and it's still far away from Edmonton, so it's like yeah, two, but, three hours. Uh, it's, yeah, I think it's about four hours, but Fort McMurray is it's quite developed you can find pretty much everything that you need over there except for a Costco. <laughs> okay, okay. That's a good point of standardization. Right. <laughs> okay, so Amar now, this is, how do you say it? The, because uh, Petro Canada, but it, had, it changed names or it got bought or what happened? So they still market their gasoline. So all the gas stations are still called Petro Canada. Um, and back in the day, it was owned by Petro Canada. Uh, then it was taken over by Suncor Energy. But they've decided to keep the name for the gas stations as Petro Canada. Just so okay. that people relate to that. Okay. And then why the shift? Finally comes the shift. <laughs> yeah. So during my transition period where I had left Husky and then I joined Suncor, there was a period of a few months where I was looking for a job. And at that time, I had applied to this membrane manufacturer in the Bay Area, but they were not hiring at the time. And then I had totally forgotten about it. Um, and then a few months after I started at Suncor, uh, they reached out to me saying that they had a role and they were interested to interview me for it. Uh, at the time, I was not actively looking to, to change roles, but I figured, hey, you know what the hell, let's try it out, worst case scenario. Um, I get a free trip to the Bay Area um, and get to experience that. Um, so I went through their processes. I had a first round interview with HR over the phone. Then they brought me in for on-site interviews with a few of the directors and personnels. And all of that went pretty well. They gave me the offer. And then I thought about it for a while. I was like, yeah, I'm, I keep moving a lot. I pretty much lived in five different cities in the last five years. Do I want to do it? Um, and at the time, I think one of my main motivators was I wanted to branch out from the oil and gas industry uh, due to the cyclicality of the, of the industry. And I wanted to try something new. Um, this role was that of a technical sales engineer. And I figured that it would be a very good skill set for me to develop and further expand on having the confidence to, to talk in front of clients and convince them as to why they should buy my product, I think that could go a long way. Uh, and apart from that, I was also going to be getting the opportunity to work with uh, business development 
and establish a new product line. So all of that was pretty exciting. And also, I think one of the things that I hadn't thought of back then, but in the last year that I've been in the Bay Area that I've realized is that once you get out of some of these smaller towns where it's only the oil and gas industry, your horizon or your mindset just broadens out so much in terms of what else is out there. Like, so specifically in the Bay Area, there is just so much going on that it, it's pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, that that essentially is the hub uh, for opportunity. And that, that was one of the main reasons why I decided to move. Yeah, definitely. Bay Area is a lot of things happening at once, too much, a lot of technology, a lot mm -hmm. of companies, a lot of interaction. So as you said, it, the land of opportunity right there. Yeah. And how is the process of moving from Canada to USA? So at oh, the yeah. moment, <laughs> were you a Canadian resident or a yes. citizen? Yes. So I was Canadian at the time, uh, which makes it easier. But in general, moving from Canada or any other country to work in the U.S. is not that easy. And I can speak from my personal experience. Um, so I think, again, I mentioned that there was a slight period between my role or my job at Husky. And when I went to Suncor, I had a few months wherein I was interviewing and looking for opportunities. And one such opportunity was with Chevron. Um, and this was also in the Bay Area, so specifically in Richmond. California. Uh, I I applied for a position. I interviewed. They called me in. I even got the offer. Uh, but at the end of it, it somehow they didn't realize or I'm not sure what happened, but they, they didn't know that I was Canadian and I would need some kind of work authorization. So once they, they found that out, uh, they rescinded the offer. And after my experience with now, if you look at any of their job postings, at the bottom, they always write that you need to have a green card and they won't be sponsoring you. So especially with any of the big companies or any major oil and gas companies, it's going to be very difficult for you to make that transition unless you are in a more senior or management role. Let's say that the membrane company already knew about your situation, I think. Yeah, and uh, they were pretty open to it. They they themselves hire a lot of engineers who are on an H-1B and they also do green card sponsorship. So generally my experience and what I've seen is that smaller companies are pretty open to it. And especially as a Canadian, the process is actually very easy. All you really need is an offer letter from the company. You go up to the border, you hand in the offer letter, you show them your transcripts, your resume. Um, the whole process takes about half an hour and you get your work visa, which is good for three years, and you can renew it after that. And the payment, is it on your behalf or the company, half or half? How... Uh, sorry, payment for the visa? Yeah. So the, the visa only costs like $50. Oh, okay. No. I, yeah. I thought, I thought I don't know why I have this impression that for in order to get or the, spon the famous sponsorship that requires from the company is because of the money. So it, what is it? it Yeah, so that might be more so for green card applications, but for specific visa that Canadians and Mexicans can get uh, due to the NAFTA, uh, it's called the TN visa. Um, and I think that just costs about $50. Okay, that's nice. I didn't know that. And I'm Mexican, so I should right. consider that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so Amar, now let us know more about the job. How is it to be in a membrane company? What exactly is the products that you sell? What industry do you serve and so on? Yeah, so our, the name of the company is Membrane Technology and Research. So I think it <laughs> you pretty much get the idea of what we sell. Our main bread and butter is membrane that is used for gas separation. So along with the membrane, we also design and fabricate all the other components or like the full skit or the system. So we're looking at heat exchangers, compressors, separators, dryers, um, depending pressure vessels, depending on what the application is. Typical customers would be refineries, petrochemical plants, pharmaceutical companies, and lately um, companies that are extracting or are working in the cannabis industry. No, that's nice, especially in California. I think the market is growing there. Yeah, 
even in Canada as well. So how does that work? Let us know more about the technical part of how does a membrane works, especially your membranes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, essentially, how do they work? So a membrane is nothing but a filter, right? Um, it likes certain things and it does not like certain things. So typically as a filter, you would expect that smaller things can or smaller molecules can pass through more easily and the bigger things get left behind. So that is one type of membrane that we offer and that's called the size selective. So a typical application would be, say if you have a gas stream which has some hydrogen, nitrogen, and some hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are typically longer chain, bigger molecules. So those will not pass through the membrane as easily. And just the smaller molecules, such as the nitrogen and hydrogen, um, you, can, you can selectively recover. So those kind of membranes we typically would sell to a plant that, say, manufactures hydrogen or let's say like an ammonia plant which uses hydrogen and they want to recover some of the the residual gases in like a vent stream so it just helps with improving overall recovery so that's mm -hmm. one type of membrane we sell uh, another type of membrane is just the opposite where hydrocarbons are easily like hydrocarbons easily pass through the membrane and your lighter gases do not So again, a uh, similar application depending on the industry. Um, membranes, they typically work on the main concept of pressure. The higher the pressure, the more driving force you have. And how the, the, the technical word for it is selectivity um, of a particular component or a compound with respect to the membrane. Or in other words, how much the membrane likes the particular compound versus something else. So say for instance, you have methane and hydrogen and your methane to hydrogen selectivity is 10 to one. The membrane is gonna let 10 of those methane molecules pass through, whereas it, and then it'll leave or let one of the hydrogen molecules go through. So the better the selectivity, the better your separation, the better your uh, performance. Okay, and what is the main product or material they're made of? Uh, most of them are polymeric. Uh, we have also branched into ceramic-based membranes, which we are using more on the in the cannabis industry now. Okay, nice. And you make them by your own in the company, or do you have, like, let's say, certain type of materials that you need to bring from abroad? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Most of it we we make in-house, um, but there are certain things that we work with other companies uh, to develop certain products. Do you work on that as well, on the design? Yes, so I do work on the design of the overall system. So sizing of the equipment, uh, putting together the overall package, and then um, developing a proposal, discussing that with the clients. Um, and given my uh, operational background, I also go to sites to help with startup as well as running any tests. You have a, a lot of, let's say, skills that the company got with your, let's say, the main asset because you work on the operations, you work at sales, you work in design. Mm -hmm. What else do you work on? I think, uh, yeah, that covers it. I'm pretty marketable in that way. <laughs> That's great. So this is my question. Will Did you already have some knowledge on membrane theory or membrane no. separations? None, none whatsoever. So you got trained or did you study by yourself? How, how were you picked? So I don't think I was picked because of my membrane knowledge or lack thereof, but it was the overall ex experience that I brought to the table. I think specifically with membranes um, that can be taught to any engineer. So that was not going to be the hard part, but the experience and the skill set that I brought to the table, I think that's what they were looking for. So the oil and gas prepare you well then? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, nice, nice, nice. What do you want to tell us more about the uh, membrane company you're right now, or maybe the industry overall? How do you see it? Um, so right now, I think we are all in a pretty challenging time. And it's, it's no different for our company as well. A lot of the big projects we were bidding on have uh, been deferred 
because a lot of the companies are now um, not making any capital investment decisions uh, at the moment. So yeah, it's uh, it's it's been a little tough for our, our company as well. But uh, things things should be picking up by Q one of next year. I think uh, that's what we are we are seeing right now. And how do you see the let's say competitors or alternatives? Are they growing or are they? They are. Well? They are. So one of our main competitors is in China, um, and as we know, like uh, the cost of manufacturing is extremely low in China. Um, and depending on the client, sometimes they are only looking at what the dollar value of the project is and not the, the quality or even how long you expect your membrane or your overall equipment to, to last, or even if you can meet the specific process guarantee that they are looking for. Um, so yeah, that's, that's some of the competition we are seeing is, is, has been emerging out of China. Yeah, definitely it must be some issue there because let's say it's kind of disloyal uh, competition because they have very strong advantage with the manufacturing mm -hmm. and especially also the material that they get. Typically, they get it uh, way cheaper because taxing is yes supportive there and in, maybe in the States or right. it's, uh, it's not that great for that. but. Mm -hmm. Let's see how it goes. Hopefully you counterbalance that, as you said, with quality, service and all that because materials, well, that's material, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they won't change. So what you can right. change is the customer support, right. uh, the clients and so on. And I think another good thing, another good thing my company really does is we heavily invest in R&D. So I think one of the things that we, uh, where we can be better than our competitors is bringing new products to market, which are better than what there are right now. That's true. Innovation is king. Definitely something that's new in the market and is working. Mm -hmm. You have no competition at all because you literally research it and develop it by yourself. Absolutely. So Amara, now we were talking also about, let's say your plans, or let's say first your hobbies and personal interest, and you said that maybe you will be interested in making a shift now towards finance. So how do you pl plan to do so? So one of the ways I'm working on that is through the CFA Charter. So the CFA stands for Chartered Financial Analyst. So I'm going through that program. I've, I wrote one of the exams last year and hopefully we'll write the second exam later this year. So I'm, mostly doing that so I can have some kind of prerequisite to show uh, colleges that I do have some finance background. And at the same time, I will be applying to graduate schools. Okay, so you want to uh, study a finance master? Or yes. What it, yeah, specifically, so, yeah, that, that master in finance. So yeah, something like an MBA or perhaps even uh, financial engineering. I have a couple of different options over there. Okay. And do you want to make something of your own or do you want to go to companies, work for some other maybe hedge funds or investment? Yeah. So, first? so me and my friend, we've actually ha have developed a tool that can help people with trading. Um, we were more so doing that to, for our own knowledge and our own experience. And Hey, I think it'll look good on our grad school applications. So yeah, absolutely. Would like to do something of my of my own but at the same time working with some of these bigger companies and learning how they do things will also be pretty valuable we should focus in in the future maybe one episode on how a let's say the chemical engineering skills can help you to make it in the trade market or so sure so what, what do you trade normally uh lately it's mostly options and how do you like learned or was it a hobby did you took a course how did you like learn it, it was trade? it was all just online so after i graduated is when i actually had money that i could afford to lose and play with um, so that's when i started investing um, learned a few hard lessons along the way investing in penny stock companies but i think that never stopped me from learning um, so once i got to options and the insane amount of leverage that it can offer, I think um, uh, that that's what got me excited about it. 
And yeah, I think I've been trading options for the last couple of years now. So I don't know if you want to add something else or shall we pass to the quick question section? Uh, yeah, sure. We can move ahead. Okay. So let me load them. So the very first one is, what do you think the chemical engineering syllabus lacks? Hmm. That's a good question. I think a little bit more of chemistry. <laughs> Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't think we do enough. It's it's more engineering with a hat with a sprinkle of chemistry. Okay. Um. So yeah, I think I think we could use a little bit more of that. I thought you were going to say something of finance or something related. No, I think uh, that is generally offered as an elective. Um. So if people who are interested in that, by all means, they can they can pick those courses. Okay. So what would you change from your student life? Hmm, what I would change. Yeah, if I could go back in time, I would uh, try to take part in more activities and events going on on campus. Because I think when I was at school, um, the way it would work is you have these four months of which you not only have to keep up with assignments, quizzes, exams, but you're also preparing or applying for jobs. Um, you're preparing for interviews, giving the interviews. So there's, there's like just way too much going on and there's always a lot of stress. Um, and then at least for me, that because of which I didn't go out and do as many other things, maybe even have like have started working out uh, earlier in my life. Uh, yeah, I think I would, I would like to go back and change those things. Okay. Well, I think you already worked a lot in, with your co-ops. So that's a good balance for that. Right. Uh, let's pass to the next one. Overrated things in chemical engineering. <laughs> I'd say the labs. The labs? <laughs> yeah, I don't, okay. I don't, I don't think the labs are very it's useful at all. Okay. No, <laughs> it's a waste of time. <laughs> What would you study other than chemical engineering? I think now, if I could, um, probably software engineering or mechatronics engineering. Okay. That software engineering or computer science, it's one of the most common ones. I exactly, hear. yeah. <laughs> Do you use books for reference when you were back in the oil industry or maybe right now? The only book I use right now for reference is a book on membrane technology the founder of my company wrote. Okay. Um, yeah, that's that's the only real book I have on my desk. So I imagine it's one of the best books out there yes, in the market. it is for membranes. What was your favorite subject? I would say uh, thermodynamics. It just made What sense. Was? Okay. okay. Yeah. It, it was very intuitive and logical. Nice. I, I, I have a, a little bit hard time on that, but I, I would say that once that you get it, it's like, wow, it's, yeah. you feel powerful. Right. Now, what was your worst or the <laughs> subject that you hated the most? Anything with biochemistry. Uh, I was really bad at that. Well, the bio part? Or yeah, what? the bio part. I, I'm just really bad at memorizing things. Um, so, yeah, that's that's where um, biology um, and anything related to that was. Okay, if you were to hire some chemical engineer graduate, what would you expect from him or her? Um, so if it's a new graduate, I would not expect too much, like sure have a decent fundamental knowledge and depending on some of the work experience they have, maybe even like some very, very basic um, knowledge of how certain equipment work. But I think the main thing I would be looking for is their attitude and um, their level of interest in learning uh, if they are curious about things and how they want to contribute. Nice. That's actually something I, haven't heard so to be a little bit more relaxed on them that's true don't be so hard on them mm -hmm. but also like try to onboard them on the work right because so what most of the things you, sorry most of the things you learn on the job so even if you're not coming in with too much technical knowledge you can you can teach that to people it's more of the soft skills that i would be looking for like how they work in a team what kind of attitude they have Yeah, soft skills is very important. It is very important. And sometimes it's underrated at, at the workplace, which is 
unfortunately not nice for the whole team. Mm -hmm. So what is your dream job? Mm, my dream job. Um, so one of my hobbies is actually teaching. So my dream job would be if I can have some kind of online teaching business where I can reach out to people or students all around the world, especially those who cannot afford to pay for private lessons and who don't have those opportunities and be able to make a difference in uh, their education. I think that would nice. be my dream job. And specifically in finance or engineering? Uh, no, it could be anything. Even um, say like high school students with uh, just basic math, physics and chemistry. Okay. Yeah, just about anything. It's nice. Nice dream to have. Mm -hmm. This is a kind of funny yet serious question. How often do you use the Laplace transform? <laughs> uh, I think I used it about a couple of months ago, to be honest. So as I mentioned, I, I like to teach and tutor people. So one of my students was writing a differential equations exam. So I did have to look it up um, to help him out with one of the problems. Okay, nice. So you do tutoring already? Yeah. And how do you get your students online or personal? Um, it's, it's both. It's uh, online um, as well as any of my students that I've worked with. They recommend me to their friends and family members. That's great. That's a nice labor you're doing there. Yeah. Okay. So what was the best advice you were given? Mm. I can't think of any, to be honest. <laughs> okay. That's... Then what was the worst advice that you can remember? Um, you know, if I have been given any such worse advice, I just take it in from one year and let it out from the other. I don't keep it in my mind. So I can't think of anything. But actually, now that you mentioned good advice, I was having a discussion with my vice president a couple of weeks back. And one of the things he told me, which I think is pretty important, especially in my role, is to be persistent. Um, and typically with an engineer, we just kind of want to like sit on our computer, do our design, but like reaching out to other people, talking to them. And again, this is the sales aspect that I'm talking about, but just talking to other people, trying to understand their point of view. I think that can help you go a long way. Yeah. Persistence is great. I think so as well. Uh, now, now that you have a lot of experience changing jobs and getting new jobs, can you give us a quick tip for resumes? For resumes, um, so what I look for if I am uh, looking over anyone's resume is no more than two pages. Uh, try to keep it clean. Don't put in too much information. I don't want to see all the courses that you've taken because everyone who's like, say, a chemical engineer has taken that kind of course. What I'm looking for is what kind of unique things you've done, not only in your job, Uh, but also from your extracurriculars. How have you made a difference? That's what I'm looking for. Um, so don't typically write any generic responsibilities that you have, but try to come up with numbers or some sort of measurable impact uh, that you made. Yeah, I would say the best thing to set you apart is to actually have other type of activities or something that well makes you different because... Being a student on chemical engineering is not good enough when you're competing against chemical engineers. Yeah, no, not at all. Okay, let's pass to the random facts. Uh, do you use or drink coffee, tea, any energy drink, wine, beer in order to get active in the workplace? No, I don't drink any of those. <laughs> uh, it's, you're, you're very healthy. <laughs> Great. No, I only drink chocolate milk. <laughs> okay, that's still something, still something. Yeah. Okay, so do you have any kind of hobby that you want to develop? Mm, I enjoy playing squash and curling, so I would want to get better at those sports. Okay, and final question. Uh, which type of podcast do you hear? A lot of finance-based podcasts. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, those were the quick questions. I hope you like them and especially the audience. So you get to know a lot of 
the person by very quick questions, I think. So mm-hmm. No, thanks thank for having you. me. I do appreciate this. And I'm looking forward to listening to some of the other interviews that you've already had. Sure. It's been great to have a lot of uh, other fellow engineers all around the world, each one of them working in different companies and with different ideas. It's great. So Amar, thank you for being here. And I know it's been more than one hour, but this time I'm pretty sure it's going to be very worth for the audience, Mm -hmm. for students out there that may have some doubts on maybe should they go from India or from Middle East to USA or Canada, right? or if they are in the oil and gas industry and want to make a shift that they see that actually there's people doing it. So you are inspir- You may be the inspiration of some students or young engineers in making that shift. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Great. So guys, we will see each other in the following episodes. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the episode. And before you go, I will really appreciate it if you take the time to share this podcast with your fellow colleagues, classmates, friends, or really anyone that might be interested on the topic of chemical engineering and its related fields. If you found this content helpful and valuable, please consider subscribing, writing, and leaving a review. Thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot. Thank you.